Now, once the recommendations have been made, it's up to, it's pretty much up to you to make the, uh, rem to, to make the changes on your controller or your infrastructure in order to do that. Because the recommendations don't fix anything. You have to actually go out and reconfigure your, your con controllers and access points. Okay, so baseline best practice number two. Now that we've moved you into five gigahertz, we want to make sure that you're using all of the five gigahertz channels that are available to you. This is another place that we see a lot of problems, especially when wireless LAN controllers have been configured with default settings and left in that state. In that case, we almost always see many, many of the potential five gigahertz channels not being used at all. So let's take a look at how we would determine that using Wi-Fi Explorer. So again, here's Wi-Fi Explorer. We've grayed out the part that I don't want you to look at. And we're looking under the channels column to begin with. So channels here. And we see channel 11 at the top. So this has been sorted. And it's showing the uh, 5 gigahertz channels here. And you could go down and do this next step using just that. But there's an easier way with Wi-Fi Explorer. And that is, if you see the four tabs here in the center, and you click on the one that says spectrum, then you get this nice, I like to think of it as a, a poor man's spectrum analysis down here in the bottom. So in this spectrum reading down below, notice that the 2.4 gigahertz frequency ranges are on this side, and the five gigahertz ranges are on this side. So we can tell the same thing down here. And when we do that, we're gonna focus in on marker number two, which if I bring that up, you can see that marker number two is showing us the first of the, the channels available in five gigahertz. When the five gigahertz frequency ranges were made available to us under FCC uh, regulatory um, allowances back in 2001, they gave us three subbands in five gigahertz. And the subbands were labeled unlicensed national information infrastructure bands. And they comprise four sets of non-overlapping channels in three separate ranges. This one is referred to as UNI-1, so Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure Band number one. And it contains channels 36, 40, 44, and 48, so four non-overlapping channels. You can see that in this case, we've got a number of SSIDs and radios that have been configured to use channel 40, 44, and 48. But do you see that nothing is using channel 36 in this case? Next, under marker number three, we see the next UNI band, UNI 2, Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure Band number two. And in it, with four non overlapping channels that are named 52, 56, 60, and 64. No radios have been configured to use that. So that, that's OK. Um, it might be OK, I should say. We need to check a little further. So why aren't we spreading some of these out into this area? It's a common concern. There could be reasons for it. We'll discuss that coming up. Next, we look at marker number four. And that brings us to the center frequencies. Now, these channels did not come up with the original allocation. They came a few years later. FCC said, OK, we've given you three subbands with four non-overlapping channels each. That's a total of 12 non-overlapping channels. Now we're going to award you another 11 non-overlapping channels. And they fit in between Uni 2 and what's going to come here in just a minute called Uni 3. We call these UNI2 Extended. That was, these were the original names. So UNI2 Extended was additional channels that uh, gave us 11 additional non-overlapping channels. We can see here, none of these channels are being used either. So we've got everybody grouped up here on three channels. Nothing here in UNI2, nothing here in UNI2E. And by the way, this is common. Let's have a chat about this. So it'd be easy for me to say, OK, just make sure that you're using all these channels in the middle. 
But that's not always the best case. If you remember the title of this baseline best practice, I said use all of the five gigahertz channels that your clients are capable of. So there are some channels here that your client devices may not be capable of. So let's have a little talk about that. When, when the first allocations came out, followed by the extended allocations, that gave us an entire total of 25 5 gigahertz channels. That was all fine for a, a certain point, but then something happened in about 2004. Uh, these, these 5 gigahertz channels first came to us with a uh, amendment to the 802.11 standard called 802.11a, and 802.11a gave us these channels. When the European Telecommunication Standards Institute looked at the five gigahertz channels for use in Europe, European Union nations. They determined that there was gonna be some conflicts with some additional radar systems that were in use. And so at that point, they issued a moratorium on Wi-Fi 802.11a being used in any European nations. And so that got back, of course, to Wi-Fi, um, to the 802.11 standards uh, working group who said, okay, we need to address this. And the way that the 802.11 working group addresses problems, they form a committee. And this committee was known as Task Group H, H is in Henry. And Task Group H, or what we call today 802.11 H, came up with the solution to allow these channels to be used. So from 2004 until about 2006, these channels were not available. They were available from 2001 or two up until 2004, but then they were retracted. Then in 2006, with the release of 802.11h, they were once again available. So can you see how that can be an issue? If you've designed your network to use these channels, but you have equipment from that time period when they weren't allowed, your client devices will never see these channels. So most, most companies, hardware vendors, just disallow these channels in the first place to make it easier so they don't have to field, field so many help desk calls. I get that. But it's doing us a disservice because how many of us have client devices from between 2004 and 2006 on our networks preventing us from getting good uh, performance out of our Wi-Fi network when we, most of our devices are, are of a newer vintage, if that makes sense. So you have to know a little bit about your, your client devices, that's key. If you don't, there's a shortcut and I'll show you that coming up. Well, actually, let me tell you about this. If you wanna find what client device capabilities you have and you're not sure, you can go out to a website from a, a guy who's in the Wi-Fi experts community, he's a volunteer, and he put together a database and his name is Mike Albano, and his w website is called clients.mikealbano.com. We'll provide a link here on this presentation so that you can go out there. And we have no affiliation. This is just a good resource for you to have. And if you go out to Mike's website, he's got this big, long list of several hundred very popular client devices. It contains Apple and Android and iOS devices and, and some devices you probably never even heard of for both uh, FCC and uh, EU companies as well as Japan and, and others, uh, countries, not companies. So if you can find your client devices on that list, he's got it spelled out what channels are available, what power, all of the different very important statistics that you'll need to do, to to uh, provide an educated design to your Wi-Fi network. But if you can't find your client devices and you don't want to take chances, then it's possible, very, very slim possibility that you would not be able to use Uni2 and Uni2e, okay? That's not the case for anything after, say, 2006. It shouldn't be. All right. now. After 2006, we had another little issue. After the FCC and the European Telecommunications Standards Institute re-allowed us to use the uh, Uni2 and Uni2e channels, there was a report uh, of, well, first of all, there had been an aircraft disaster. 
there was an aircraft disaster that happened that uh, was caused by wind shear in the United States. And because of that, the Federal Aeronautic Administration, FAA, uh, required the 802.11 standard to remove these three channels. And because of wind shear, uh, the FAA um, started installing terminal Doppler weather radar installations at all of the airports and several other uh, types of installations around the U.S. It was determined that uh, some, some users of Wi-Fi 5 gigahertz specifically on channels 120, 124, and 128 were causing interference to these terminal Doppler weather radar installations. And so uh, there was a requirement that for a period of about two years, we no longer could use these three channels. So now, in 2006, we got back all of these channels with 802.11h, transmit power control, and uh, uh, dynamic frequency selection. Then it was taken away for these three channels only for a period of about two years. And then in 2013, it was reallowed again. So now, if you have equipment that has been built and configured as of 2013 or later, these channels are not an issue. But if you have anything in between that period of time, probably from 2010 to 2013, there could be problems with that. So what do you do in those cases? So if you have any questions, if you can't find your clients listed on Mike Albano's database and you want to not take your chances, you can go into your controllers and remove these three channels from the channel set. So 120, 124, 128, just take them out. Okay. And your controller should still allow the use of the rest of these. There's another issue. So when we come up here to the top of Uni2E, there's a, a new channel, channel 144, never existed until 2013. The FCC gave us that channel in 2013. If you're going to allow that channel to be in your channel set that will be automatically configured by your controllers, make sure that your client devices can tune to that channel. And how do you do that? Again, Michael Bono's database or your vendor literature, documentation and literature, or if you don't trust it, just remove it from the channel set. So worst case, we've taken the 25 possible channels and now we've removed four of those, still leaving 21 non-overlapping channels. However, there is one more issue. We'll get to that in just a second. Now we move up to Uni3. So from the very earliest, Uni1, Uni2, Uni3 were available. Uni1 and Uni3 have been, they, they have had no restrictions of any kind. So they're the safest eight non-overlapping channels. And sure enough, this controller has stuck all of the SSIDs, all of the radios has been configured for Uni1 and Uni3 only. They're not taking any chances here. The chances that we're taking by using these channels are very minimal, and you should try to use all of these channels if, if possible. By stacking everybody up on here, the performance is going to be degraded uh, by a lot. It'll be a noticeable degradation. There is one other channel that's, in, that's questionable that you should know about, and that's channel 165. That's also a new channel came to us in 2013 along with 144. So worst case scenario, everybody's client devices should be able to use of the 25 possible channels, at least 20 of these non-overlapping channels. And if you're not using them, there should be a reason. So just because the controller doesn't automatically set these channels, that's not correct. You should be able to use these. So we've got to configure that, or we've got to figure out what's going on. This is all wasted bandwidth. By dumping everybody into these few narrow channels, everybody is um, contending with each other to get their transmission opportunities. And the amount of contention, the more users you add, the poorer the performance for each of the users on the network. So we want to get as many channels as possible. That's the key to high performance in Wi-Fi, more channels, and fewer collisions. Okay, so 
let's take a look at our scorecard and our remediation recommendations for baseline best practice number two. And we're going to have to fail this one on this school as well. And the reason for this is because only Uni 1 and Uni 3 are in use. It turns out that this school had configured their controller, left everything at default. The firmware on this controller did not allow the use of Uni 2 or Uni 2E, and so it just forced everything onto Uni 1 and Uni 3. There was no reason for that. The school provided all the equipment to the uh, students, and all of the equipment is dual band capable, and everything was newer than 2013, so easily should have supported all of these different uh, channels. So here's how you can tell in your case. When you see Uni2 and Uni2C not being used, there could be reasons for that, as we've kind of discussed. The first one, verify that all your client devices can use the Uni2 channels. And if they can, then verify that the controller and access points can support all of the Uni2 channels. So it's possible, even though your clients can support it, maybe the equipment you've got does not support it. So in that case, check and, if necessary, replace. Next, verify that the Uni2 channels have been enabled on the controller because just because your controller can support the channels, by default, almost all controllers have that capability uh, disabled. And you have to manually turn it on with a checkbox. So make sure that's on. Now here's another thing. It's possible that the controller has been configured properly. The clients can support it, but there is so much channel usage in those middle uni channels in the area that your controller has correctly said, well, it wouldn't be good for us to use those channels because they are overutilized now. If that was the case, we would have seen in the spectrum analysis, we would have seen SSID stacked up on uni2 and uni2e, and we didn't. But it is a possible uh, good reason why the controller might not assign those. If you're not using the DFS channels of Uni2 and Uni2E, it's possible there are radar installations nearby. However, the radar installations don't use the entire Uni2 and 2E channels. They only use smaller frequencies, like for instance 120, 124, and 128. That area might be uh, used by TDWR. And if that's the case, then it would be correct not to assign your, your access points to those channels. However, when no, none of the channels are being used in those center frequencies, that's not correct. The way you can tell if, um, if there are radar, radar installations and your, access, your controllers are correctly trying to use those but are having to move out of those areas because they're detecting radar pulses, is to go into the log files of your controller and look for radar events or DFS events. And you'll see that in the log files. In addition to that, verify that your controller and your access point firmware, that the revision that you're using now currently supports Uni2 and Uni2C. And if all of those are correct and you're still not using those channels, it's time to pick up the phone and call Tier 1 support pretty much tell you that tier one support has one main job and that's to prevent you from talking to tier two. And it's tier two that you need to get to in order to get a firmware replacement that will support those Uni2 and 2E channels. We've seen this many times with our customers.